Hello and welcome to Liquid Future. We are very lucky to guest to have our guest, Ellen Landemore, an associate professor of political science at Yale University. Her academic interests include democratic theory, political epistemology, constitutional theory, and the philosophy of social sciences. Her 2013 book, Democratic Reason, was awarded the, the David and Elaine Spitz Prize for best book in democratic theory. She's currently working on a new book about the contemporary problems faced by democracies and how what some of the solutions might look like opening up more. And she has a very wide ranging interest. She's studied all sorts of experiments going on throughout the world on different post representative democratic systems. And we're really lucky to have her today. Thank you for being here. Thank you for having me. Did I do that justice? Did I do your introduction justice? Oh, yes, you did a wonderful introduction. Thank you very much. And you pronounced the name perfectly. <laughs> Thank you. Appreciate that. <laughs> it is tricky. It is tricky. So just to start, could you just summarize at a high level what your favorite area to study is, what your core focus is? So my core focus, I would say, is uh, something called deliberative democracy. Uh, it's... Um, I would say a, a space where um, theorists talk about how we could increase the legitimacy of our, of our political systems by making them more deliberative and participatory by including citizens at different levels of you know, political decision making. And it's, it's very much shaped by the ideas of figures like um, Jürgen Habermas, but also John Rawls, Josh Cohen, uh, people like that. And now there's like, uh, it's, it's something that started, um, you know, in the 90s as a reaction to the then dominant paradigm of aggregative democracy, which was all about voting and choosing between competing elites. And it has only grown since, since then. It started as a very um, ideal normative paradigm and it's now turned into a, a, an actually um, a much more empirical agenda so uh, there are a lot of experiments going on around the world so we, we are learning more about what works and what doesn't and it looks like a sustainable path if you want if we want to improve uh, our, our political regimes and so what sort of changes would this entail to our current regimes you mean mm -hmm. well uh, it would in, it would involve expanding the number of people who um, get to input a political decision-making process, a law-making process, so making it more inclusive of a greater diversity of, of people and making sure that even those who are not actually involved in the decision-making part actually at least get involved in the deliberation part ahead of the decision part. So one um, example of that I think is happening actually in France right now. I don't know if you followed the, the news over there, but what, what, what has happened um, is that in, in the fall, we had a, this huge social crisis, like the Yellow Vest movements pushed back against some taxes, uh, you know, uh, implemented by, by the government. And a lot of uh, commentators said, well, that's because the system is broken. It's not taking into account their perspective. Uh, these people put on a yellow vest precisely because they feel invisible in the system. So they, they're trying to be more visible. And, they, and one of their main uh, demand was for a so-called RIC. Um, it's a, a referendum d'initiative citoyenne, and it means a, a referendum initiated by citizens. They wanted to have the possibility to put things on the table to put things on the, on the legislative agenda and have the whole population vote on them. And why do they want this? Because the same way they are not seen in the system, they are not heard in the system. You, you get a sense that even with the, you know, the, the, the Macron revolution, as it's sometimes called, the, the fact that uh, this young president brought to power a lot of women, a lot of people of color, uh, a greater diversity of profiles, there are still a number of blind spots um, in the government's sort of outlook on, on society's problems and they completely ignored the periphery pretty much, you know. People who live in rural areas, who uh, use the car to go to work every day and were heavily punished basically by this new um, uh, tax on gas that the, the government wanted to introduce supposedly for ecological uh, purposes. 
So, so you have a crisis in France in the fall, and the reaction uh, from the government was actually, I think, a good one. Uh, it was to say, look, we need to talk more. We need to have um, a more inclusive uh, consultation of the population. We need to have what they called a great national debate. So that's what they did, and in, uh, in, in you know between between basically December and, and January, they decided, okay, we need to get this started and, and uh, up and running very quickly. So um, I was skeptical that this could work in such a short period of time, actually, but they pulled it off. And so between January and, and March, end of end of March, they uh, opened up, uh, you know an online platform for people to write up their grievances, their demands, their suggestions. The um, president went around the country uh, to meet uh, mayors and various uh, you know, groups. So that part was not really the, certainly the, the most uh, uh, aligned with the values of deliberative democracy because it came across to a degree and to a lot of people as an exercise in, in political communication rather than an exercise in political deliberation. It was all about him. It was a, more of a political campaign type of move. But what was very interesting for me is that they actually um, managed to spur the organization uh, on the ground of um, you know, uh, many citizens who, who gathered in their living rooms, in the school, uh, in the schools, the local school, the local city halls, to talk about the topics that the government wanted them to talk about, but also many other things. Actually, a lot of the conversation went outside the, the, the sort of fixed agenda. And even more interestingly, between March 15th and, and March 30th, roughly, there were uh, randomly selected assemblies of um, ordinary citizens in uh, 18 regions of France who gathered over the course of one day and a half to talk about specific issues and make proposals and react to uh, the, the, the feedback that had already been gathered through the, the great debate in the town hall meetings um, prior to the, to the regional assemblies. So you had all these sort of methods employed at different levels on a scale that I think is completely uh, unheard of. I mean, you know, I, I've, I've been studying these so-called democratic innovations for a long time and usually they're much smaller. They're uh, you know, limited to one particular issue. They don't last very long, uh, you know, in, in time. So, and, and this is in the process of being studied. So we don't know if anything good is going to come out of all of this, if anything serious is going to come out of all of this. Um, but what's really interesting is that for me, it's, it's clearly an effort to include more people in the deliberative process, to try to approximate this ideal of, you know, um, a truly deliberative public sphere. And uh, in fact, it looks as if uh, President Macron took his cue from philosophers like Habermas, because he, at the end of the first great debate with the 600 mayors uh, in Normandy in January, he used a phrase, he said, we need to create a republic of permanent deliberation, something like that. And that struck me as really new. I mean, I don't know um, of any other head of state who's been committed to deliberation in that sort of like deep philosophical sense. Um, so again, it might be just a buzzword that is using for strategic purposes, trying to gain time, trying to reconquer his electorate, uh, trying to, you know, uh, yeah, uh, appease the, the Yellow Vest movements, which meanwhile hasn't really stopped and continues to demonstrate every weekend since, uh, since last fall. So who knows where this is going, but I feel like the time is ripe for these deliberative democratic ideas, which used to be considered very utopian, very unpractical, uh, you know, and, and now in fact show that, you know, uh, show their relevance. Hmm. So how would we be able to judge whether or not these reforms are successful, looking back on them uh, after the fact? Ah, uh, you mean in the in the French case? Yeah. Well, that's a very good question. Um, we, you know, I, I suppose it, it would be good if, first of all, we we went back to a state of social peace, um, and people stop breaking stuff on the Champs Elysees, uh, you know, every weekend, for example, uh, and if the Yellow Vests themselves 
you know, recognize that this has borne its fruits and that uh, things are getting better. And so that would be the ideal scenario. Um, but even if it doesn't uh, solve, you know, the crisis in France, I think um, to the extent that, because I think this crisis runs really deep and I'm not sure, um, you know, it can be solved just like that with like this one time effort at uh, addressing the crisis. I, th I think it would be, I'm still successful in my view if it entrenched in political discourse and in political practices the idea that we need to listen to ordinary citizens and include their inputs in the policy in the policy process a lot more than is currently the case and and if we and if politicians going forward really took seriously the idea that citizens are competent and, and have legitimacy in expressing themselves and influencing the, the course of things because you really see clash of cultures at the level of officials and, and you see it in their discourse and you see it in their contradictions. So for example, the prime minister, um, Edouard Philippe, I don't think um, was all that committed to the idea of a great national debate. I think a lot of advisors of, of Macron thought this is a terrible idea. We don't know how to organize this. It's going to fail. People will um, not participate. Um, uh, they will feel manipulated or whatever the people has to say, it will be stupid. They will just ask for more uh, goodies and fewer taxes and it won't be coherent. And, and um, so you, you saw some of that fear and distrust in the way the public debate was organized, actually. For example, the randomly selected assemblies were really constrained in terms of what they could talk about, uh, in terms of how their time was managed in terms of the uh, way the organizers uh, plugged certain things from government that the, 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 the participants had to listen to for an hour, you know, PowerPoint about the results of the great debate and, 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 um, and how it had been organized up to that point. And so th there's a sense that the go at, in the government up there, there are people who just don't trust deliberation and just don't trust the people to take part in it. And yet yeah, this happened. So, so I, I think that there will be a before and an after. I think, I hope French politics used to be very traditional, very conservative in its ways. You know, that there was this idea that there's representative democracy where all the legitimacy is confined. And then there's chaos, mob rule, you know, direct democracy, which is an illusion. And, and what I see is a, is a change in, in the perception, including at the top, of where legitimacy comes from. And, and, and the idea is that it's no longer located strictly within the um, elected institutions or, or the, the, the sort of formal bodies of appointed courts, administrations and all that. It's, it's also in the claims of people who demonstrate on the street, provided they don't you know, destroy everything in the, in the process. Um, and so, I, I think we will have to build this republic of permanent deliberation one way or another and whatever that means. I mean, it needs to be institutionalized. The, what happened in France between January and March needs to uh, be made sort of permanent so that, no, we can't have everybody gather all the time to decide about everything, but there needs to be ways to, to institutionalize the participation of ordinary citizens. For me, the, the, most, the most promising institutionalization would be the creation of a permanent um, body of citizens that would be randomly selected. And that body would have to have the same kind of legitimacy as an elected assembly and be empowered to set an agenda, make some decisions on some issues. We can debate about what exactly its place and role would be and its responsibilities, but, but definitely this is something that I see as a... Um, you know, a meaningful way to, to change democracy as we practice it today. Yeah. Yeah, the, the specifics of the proposals that I've heard are that these, the deliberative bodies w might be focused on one topic at a time. So you could have the random selection of the body to deal with this question of gas taxes, and you'd have mm -hmm. a separate random body to deal with questions around a different issue. And, a, and so you could... Um, give this this truly representative body representative statistically representative body the amount of time necessary you know weeks months 
and have experts come and, and make their case on each side of the issue. Um, but that that would be a way to actually scale this up and that it would resemble like a, a jury that people are familiar with right now where you have this randomly selected group spend the time it needs to come to what it considers a fair decision and, and have the different sides make its case. Yes, so, so what you describe are um, the so-called mini-publics that um, you know, uh, we have an example of in the, the British Columbia Citizens Assembly, for example, of uh, I think it was 2006, six, eight. I'm not, I'm not sure, which was gathered, it was about 160 people, I think, who gathered um, every weekend or every other weekend for several weeks, several months, to come up with a proposal on electoral reform. Now, that's one classic example. A more recent example, a uh, very successful one, has been the uh, Irish case. So in Ireland, they had actually two of those, and most recently one on, on, on abortion and the possibility of amending the Irish constitution to introduce a right to uh, abortion. And that was passed last June, actually. So the proposal of um, the Citizens' Assembly on this issue was put to a referendum and voted um, in June 2018. That assembly included 99 randomly selected citizens and it gathered for, I think, a couple of months as well, with access to experts, um, they listened to obstetricians, uh, testimonies of women having gone through an abortion, uh, doctors, etc. Et and so, so these things, they already exist and they work. What you, what you describe, though, are, are cases um, of assemblies that are tasked with only one thing. My own view is that I think we are, we're ready to go to the next stage, which is to give them a sort of general agenda setting function. And so they shouldn't be just one task kind of assemblies. We can have those, you know, it's not incompatible. But what I'm talking about is something, what I think, you know, is even more ambitious, which is to, to place at the level of national institutions on the par with an elected chamber, like the Senate, uh, like, uh, you know, like the, the House of Representatives, um, an assembly of ordinary citizens that you could call the House of the People or Lotocratic um, Assembly or whatever name uh, is most appropriate, and whose function would be to, to possibly set the agenda for the other assemblies. Because I think that what's, what, what's a big problem in our current democracy is that the elected elites focused on issues that just sometimes seem completely disconnected from what people actually want. And so we need those elected officials who are competent in many ways to be put on the right track again and focus on issues that matter to the American people, the French people. Um, so, so it's more of a question of setting your priorities right and, and making them accountable to those priorities. And it turns out that voting for them every four years on a particular political program doesn't work. They end up ignoring all kinds of things that are actually very important for uh, for the French people or the American people. So, so yeah, so mini publics for you know single issues are great. I think we can even do more. And and as you're sort of implicitly alluding to, this is a worldwide problem. Mm. This isn't limited to France. This isn't limited to the U.S. But there are these movements happening all over the world, and they've been going on for for some time. You mentioned the the was a British Columbia case. Yes. Was did you say what year did you say that was? I'm not sure. I thought it was 2008, but I'm not oh, sure. 2008. Anymore. Maybe 2012 actually. So, so there's been this. Um, it seems like we're at a sort of inflection point in the last decade or two decades where these sorts of ideas are really picking up. Is that right? I, I think that's right. Um, why do you think? What is it about this time that? Why now? Why not 30 years ago? Does that make sense? Is that the case? Because I, my understanding is you, you've also done quite a lot of work on, on digital tools, and you did mention a little bit about the digital tools in France, but it sounds like what you're advocating right now wouldn't require any sort of digital infrastructure. Uh, so interesting that you bring these two questions together, because I was thinking, why did the Arab Spring happen you know, in 2011 and not earlier? And some people have attributed it to the role of social media, for example, that... Um, Social media allow for very quick and costless coordination um, mm -hmm. for you know large groups of people. So it, it doesn't necessarily allow you to sustain a revolution because uh, for that you need a lot more you know a lot 
deeper roots, if you will. But in terms of mobilizing people to go on the street, like we, like we now see again in Algeria, like we're seeing in Sudan at the moment, social media, uh, you know, cell phones and smartphones and are amazing tools. I mean, they, they, they allow instant coordination, communication. They basically dissolved so-called pluralistic ignorance when, you know, you think that everyone else supports the regime and so you refrain from, you know, saying what you truly think, uh, when in fact, most people are like you. They just You just don't know. And so once you have access to that sort of like um, collective perspective on where people stand, it, it makes collective action possible. So, so that could explain also why... Uh, but, but I, at least I think it's a multi-factor explanation. I mean, surely social media and the new technologies have played a role in allowing for this um, self-awareness of the public. Uh, it's true of the Gilets jaunes, of the Yellow Vests as well in France. I mean, there are people who used to be actually uh, completely isolated. You know, there are people who are in the precarious middle class or, or uh, you know, working class for some of them who are hanging on to their job but can't pay the bills at the end of the month, who live in rural areas, they're not connected to the center, they're not connected to communities. They, and they one day got so fed up because of this tax, they went on to these traffic circles um, in rural areas, you know, on highways, on, 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 on natural roads, to talk to each other uh, about the issue and, 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 and just vent and come up with a plan. And these traffic circles, to me, are like the equivalent of the the coffee shops, you know, and the salons celebrated by Habermas when, when we think of the, you know, uh, the, the 18th century France or, or Europe in general, where people talked about political ideas and became politicized and came up with a plan for a different future. So that's where the action is now, because coffee shops are for rich people. Uh, so traffic circles are for people who actually want to change things now. Uh, and, and so I'm not sure why it has to happen now. I think it's a conjunction of um, breakdown of the existing system, which you see in uh, you know, the 2008 crisis, the Brexit crisis, the 2008 financial crisis, then the Brexit crisis, then the, the populist surge uh, everywhere. Clearly something's not working. Meanwhile, people get you know, connected through social media, they have a, a maybe a better understanding of the problems as well. They have a better understanding of, of other people's problems and, and the problem of the system. And there's a maturation um, of certain ideas like deliberative democracy. I think they, you know, Habermas was not really accessible to a lot of people. It's, it's high, uh, you know, high level philosophy. And now, in the last 30 years, this theory has been brought down to earth. Um, experiments have been run. Blogs have been written, um, very clear examples of successful or at least semi-successful applications of those ideas are available now, you know, from Iceland to Ireland, to British Columbia, to, um, to uh, you know, South Korea, although it's probably less on the radar of, of Westerners, but it's also a very interesting uh, place to look at. Um, so I think that, that's the conjunction of this factor that may explain why it's happening now and not before. Yeah, I mean, of course, there there was there were large demonstrations at other periods in time. I mean, there's yeah. without a doubt we can we can identify mass movements that have happened. So I just wanted um, to you know in yeah. France, for example, um, Ségolène Royal, a former presidential candidate, ran a campaign uh, on the do we an ideal of collective intelligence and citizen participation and. But it didn't catch somehow. Um, she didn't win. She she lost to um, Sarkozy, who is a classic sort of like party animal. Top, I mean, she was a party animal too. But you know, much more in the in the vertical use of power that our uh, French politicians are very fond of. And so so th this kind of died down. And and I feel like even Obama didn't quite similarly use the ideas from you know. Um, grassroots democracy, bottom-up democracy, collective intelligence, when he campaigned, but then once in power, did things in a very traditional way, uh, you know, the, you know, yeah. sort of not such a diverse group of people at the top, um, very top-down, very, very non-consultative, very non-participatory, and so it's really puzzling why it didn't happen before, but it didn't happen before. 
Well, in the Obama case, they they set up the We the People website. Yeah. If you remember this, the online online petition, the administration tool, and the the pledge was if if any you could write in a question that you want to be asked or an issue that you're particularly concerned about, and if they got fifty thousand co-signers, they'd give an official mm. response. And I think they raised it to a hundred thousand. And it was seen as this as this watershed moment, as this big breakthrough. And I think it pointed in the direction of something really powerful, but then they ended up ignoring the top few questions. The top few questions had to do with uh, surveillance and legalization of cannabis, if I remember right. And they yeah. just straight up ignored both of the both of those issues. So there's that, but there's also, I think, uh, yes, it was a breakthrough moment and, and, and no, it wasn't. I mean, first of all, just putting up an, you know, an online platform doesn't compensate for building the you know the grassroots foundation of a true participatory Absolutely. democracy so it was a cool move uh it, it was not a serious engagement with with the ideas of uh, participatory and deliberative democracy so how serious were they i'm not sure i think it was a, an idea that uh technology you know it but maybe it was naivete i mean i, I think at the time a lot of people still believe in technology as like the, 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 the magic key that was going to open all these wonderful doors. And, and now we're in this moment of actual, um, this dystopian moment where technologies have actually proven to be really bad for democracy in many ways. So, so looking back, it looks quite naive to think that just opening up a website would, would take care of it. Um, yeah, so... Okay. Can you expand upon that a little bit more? So to, you you began by saying a minute ago that the old idea oh, yeah, in, well, in French true. conversation was um, was trustworthy representation versus the chaos mob rule of direct systems. So how, I mean, there, there's got to be something to that, as you're sort of pointing out, there, there's this disorder. So what is the difference between a successful opening up and a um, dangerous Right. mass movement well so what i've come to conclude is that the first thing to do is to have the right conceptual categories to talk about different forms of participation or groups claiming to have a right to say something about politics so until now we, we've, we've you know we, we've we've thought of representation as electoral representation the people who can be representatives have to be elected and i think we need to expand that box to to be able to say no, actually, people who demonstrate, who chant on the streets, who, you know, uh, have claims and, and just show up to defend them are, in a way, representatives. They are what um, a colleague of mine, um, Mark Warren, calls citizen representatives, meaning they're not elected, they're not professional politicians, they didn't run a campaign, but at this point in time, they are carrying the you know, the interest of a, of a part of the population beyond their immediate self. And in fact, it's shown in the, in the, in the data. I mean, in France, the yellow vests, which are a fraction of, of the population, obviously, uh, you know, a couple of thousands, they had the support of over 57% of the population. Why? Yeah. Because their problems were seen as legitimate problems. Their issues were seen as legitimate issues and not just their issues, but the issues of, of a lot of people in, in the larger public. So, so then when, when Macron said, I'm the legitimately elected president and these people are agitators, mob rule, didn't come across really well because it's just not true. The, 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 you know, okay, th there's a fraction of, you know, the demonstrators that, that are agitators and violent, you know, um, you know uh, parasites on, on, the, on, the, on the process, I think. And, but the, the people who demonstrated are, are legitimate representatives, not elected ones, but they have a certain kind of a democratic quality and legitimacy that we need to be able to conceptualize. So my, my thinking is that instead of looking at them as a, you know, a form of direct democracy, uh, we should look at them because it, they, they're, they're only a fraction of the population. So for me, direct democracy is, is a referendum, for example, when you have if not the, the totality, at least a large, you know, uh, a majority number of people showing up to vote, those groups should be seen as um, self-selected representatives, and they have a right to be listened to and to participate in the process. 
Similarly, the people who are chosen to participate in uh, randomly selected bodies, like the mini publics we were talking about, they're not elected either, but they have demo democratic credentials. They, they, you know, um, they represent the rest of the citizenry in a way, just by being themselves, just by looking and feeling and thinking like the rest of the population. So they too should be seen as um, having a right to a say in, in the political process. So the question for democratic theorists like me is, how do we move from a, a, a paradigm where all the democraticity, as I call it, and the legitimacy are located in the electoral sphere to a system in which there are competing claims to democraticity and legitimacy coming from different types of representatives, some of which are not elected. And, and that's, that's where the, the difficulty is, um, at least uh, as a prior step to all these changes uh, we may want to consider. And the, the difficulty specifically is, is what does that formal structure look like? Yes. Is that the question? Yes, because I'm not, I'm not entirely sure. I mean, I, we, we could say, look, uh, we made a mistake in the 18th century. We, we chose election as a way to select representatives, when in fact, as historians of ADS tell us, this was all along an aristocratic, oligarchic way of choosing rulers. So it's just not consistent. It's not coherent with the ideal of popular rule, rule of, by, for the people. So we could be a revolutionary and say, forget about elections. We're going, going to move back to the Greek system of pure sortition. All the rulers are selected by, uh, by lot. Uh, yes, it would be more coherent. I also think it would be crazy because, you know, uh, we have to start from where we are. Uh, we're not going to up, upend our, our existing regimes completely. And also, I think that elections do have some democratic credentials in the way that, you know, um, voters at least have an equal voice. And, and, and so it's not completely purely oligarchy. So, and, and, you know, these regimes have done good things. We've had them around for 200 years. I mean, I wouldn't throw out the baby with the bathwater like some people want to. But, but it's important to still think of all the, the problems conceptually with elections. So how do we fix this um, system, which has all these, all these like semi-oligarchic blind spots, which is not inclusive enough, which failed to anticipate something like uh, the yellow vest crisis? How do we make it more inclusive? participatory and deliberative. And in here you have tons of models. I mean, you could add a third chamber that would be randomly selected. Uh, you could combine that with um, a decentralization of power, of course, at the, at the communal level in particular, the municipal level, where you would create uh, also randomly selected assemblies to sort of supervise and, and guide and, and help the, the work of elected officials. So here I'd like to mention what's going on in Madrid. In Madrid, uh, it's going to be, it's going to stay in, in, in history as the first city that has created a, a randomly selected body of um, uh, advisors to elected officials. So they, they are going to be in position for, for a year. I think it's 49 citizens. And their goal is to do that, to, to, to guide and nudge and, and advise and and help along the work of elected officials. And, and is, it, is it going to work? Are they going to be ignored by the elected officials? Uh, is some kind of synergy going to appear? We just don't know. I think it's an exciting moment because any, anything is possible. It's also a, a moment of, of great ignorance. We, we just don't know what's possible, what's not, and what can work and what can't. So we, we need more, more experimentation and but to get more experimentation, you need to, to trust people and trust that this is worth doing and, and, and that it has a chance of succeeding. So that's why I, I'm pretty proud of, of the French uh, experiment. I think it's a, it's a great move in the right direction. And it seems like there, so there, there's two steps to the problem. One step is, can we come up with what the formal institution looks like? And the second step is, can we actually enact, can, can we actually get it? give it legitimate Best. power, you know? Right. Yeah, exactly. And so ha how, if you look at the various movements historically in recent times and historically, um, what, what is the path to actually getting the new model enacted? Like in Madrid, how, how did this come about? 
who do you have to convince? I mean, I, you know what I, do you understand the question? So, so in Madrid, I don't know how they did it, but I, so I can compare two examples. One is Iceland and then the other is the French case again. So in, in, in Iceland, you know, in, in 2012, for your viewers that uh, may not know about this, but in 2012-13, they had this amazing, um, I mean, between 2010 and 13, actually, they had this amazing participatory constitutional process where they tried to rewrite their constitution using all these deliberative and participatory techniques. And they started with a national sample of 950 randomly selected citizens whose task over one day was to set up the agenda for whatever came next. Uh, in particular, the values that they wanted to see entrenched in the constitution. But that idea didn't come from government. Um, it was taken on board by government after, after it was first implemented by a grassroots uh, group of uh, activists and entrepreneurs called the Ant Hill. And they self-financed and they, they, they created a national forum in 2009 where they talked about the crisis and solution to the crisis. And it was such a big hit, such a success, and it was covered by the media and you know, had a lot of um, echo in the population that when uh, the new government came to power, they said, OK, we need to replicate that. Um, I think they, they were basically inspired by the example set by, by the grassroots uh, associations. I know that in, uh, so, so, so basically what I'm saying is that I don't know how you convince governments to copy this kind of uh, grassroots um, initiative, but when the initiatives are good and they have a lot of resonance in the country, I think it's more likely that government will pick them up. And similarly in uh, Ireland, so I'm less familiar with that case, but what, I'm, what I read is that actually this also wasn't really initiated by government of its own free, you know, uh, will or at the beginning it was pushed for by a group of activists well funded by groups in the u.s actually apparently you know promoting deliberative and participatory democracy and they they organized small groups uh, small deliberative groups in in all kinds of cities across uh, ireland and then they garnered enough momentum to push in government for the creation of a citizen assembly in france um how did that happen? So in France, it's, it's a bit more puzzling, I guess. How did that happen? Um, I think it happened so quickly, to be honest. I'm not, uh, I'm not entirely sure who pushed for it initially, but I know we had something called the CNDP, which is a, a, an, as, uh, an institution whose whole purpose is to cultivate deliberation in the public sphere and, you know, try to organize the public sphere so that it's it's generally more participatory more deliberative and it was pushed aside by government in a very strange move that to this day you know some people call a power move uh, they, they, because they wanted to keep control of the way the whole thing was going to be organized you're describing the examples from the last decade but if you want to you know you're saying going back to the mistake we made in the 18th century i mean i hate i hate to be too too uh dark but but the, the current system that we've inherited was the result of war, right? You know, yeah. it's, a, it's an armed uprising, yeah. whether in the U.S. With, with the American Revolution or France with you know, the guillotines and, and everything. Yeah. And so I think we have counterexamples nowadays, you know, in Taiwan, the, the GovZero movement, they, they had this crisis and there were demonstrations in the street. And then the demonstrators ran for national office and they were able to get into, into the national administration. So I certainly hope that, that the path forward is, is nonviolent. Um, is, that, is it clear that that is the case, that there are these successful examples of the system reforming itself? Yes, and like you, I very much hope the, the future is nonviolent. Um, you know, again, the French case is really interesting because it became violent in, in proportion that, that I, I, I've never seen, um, you recent, know, the, the, recent, yeah, yeah, yeah no, yeah. this, this was really, uh, really scary. So, so it's as if, you know, the, if the system doesn't reform quickly, it could go really badly. So I feel like these elites who have been very reluctant to believe in this ideal of participation and deliberation, now they don't have a choice. It's imposed on them by, societal evolutions, demands, and, and they just cannot pretend not to see them anymore. So f to go back to that prime minister I was mentioning, Edouard Philippe, who's on the, the right wing sort of uh, 
uh, classic, uh, you know, elected official, uh, who's very strong ad advocate of representative democracy, you know. Uh, he said to, uh, in a public meeting in March, after the, I think during uh, the time when the randomly selected assemblies were still taking place, he said uh, something along the lines of uh, deliberative democracy and participatory democracy, these are ideas whose time has come. Uh, I think they are just, you know, something like that. So, so basically, I think he's changed his mind. I mean, maybe for purely practical and strategic reasons, and because he doesn't have a choice, or because he's been convinced by by you know by by the relative success of these um, of these experiments, I'm not sure. But the fact is that if these, if these elected elites want to survive, they will have to adapt and and, and rather quickly. So uh, I'm hopeful that you know it's going to happen. Yeah, yeah, that, that makes perfect sense. Um, I I can't help but but comments you're saying you're saying his quote was he was the big fan of representative democracy i've heard some people start to refer to it as misrepresentative democracy misrepresentative democracy yeah, yeah. I, I think it's charming well yes it's uh it's not bad uh, it depends what you mean by representation one one another thing exactly that, that you know is very is a an avenue for research really for democratic theorists is this concept of representation i actually i'm sorry to say that we 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 don't have such a good grasp on what it means, and it means uh, tons of things and different things to different people. But by representative democracy, for the most part right now, we mean electoral democracy. And I think exactly. there are different ways to be a representative. And um, electoral democracy is biased. It's only representing uh, certain interests, certain views. It's probably useful, but it's probably also insufficient and so it needs to be complemented supplemented by different types of representation including of the of the sortition based type and the self selected uh, based type as well because you know like for example very clearly again in the french case the sortition based assemblies so i went to some of them i, I sat on the one in rouen and one in uh, in a former french colony uh, in martinique and at the end of the day uh, you know, even though it's random and they did their best to have a statistically, you know, demographic sample of the population, you still had, uh, from from a sort of like anecdotal, you know, uh, perspective, an overrepresentation of of older people. Um, you know, the young just didn't show up. Uh, the extremely poor didn't show up. The, the, the it was people who were really interested in politics who accepted the invitation so you, you also had another misrepresentation of those who had lost faith or were apathetic or just rejected the whole thing so that's why you know electoral representation will represent a certain swath of the population um, sortition based representation will at least unless it's it's uh, mandatory will only capture another section of the population, a much broader one. So I think it's, it's, it's very good still, but insufficient. And then the self-selected um, representation of people like the Yellow Vest is essential because those people were neither part, uh, they don't feel represented in uh, elected assemblies and they don't feel that represented in the sortition-based assemblies either. And many of them just very, very much refuse to participate. So, I mean, I saw one, at least one or two yellow vests in the, the wrong um, assembly that I participated in. So their views were voiced and were there. But uh, it's just to say that it, it, you can't, it's very hard. I mean, the people as a concept is very hard to, to represent properly. So you need multiple methods. And, but then at the end of the day, it needs to resolve somehow into this is the body that can create yes. official legal new legislation. Yes. And so before you were describing this, this people's house as sort of a advisory body or, or the Madrid system where these are advisory bodies, do you think that that goes far enough? Is that, is that maybe a nice first step to take and we'll see how that resolves? Is that sort of the way to think about it? So I'm not sure I said advisory as much as agenda setting. Mm -hmm. And agenda yeah, setting true. could be mandatory. It could be that, you know, this is what you guys in the elected assembly have to decide on. We're not giving you a choice. 
uh, so it's, it's a form of decision, but at the level of the menu that um, elected uh, officials have to choose from or decide on. Uh, I, 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 that said, that too is, is, is more of a prototype or a concept of an idea than a reality. Right now, this agenda setting uh, generalist assembly doesn't exist anywhere. So for now, what we should probably try is start with an advisory body. It's true that in the transition, you know, there's a difference between conceptualizing the, the ideal or like the blueprint and then thinking of ways to transition towards that. Uh, and and we, don't, we don't know enough about what works and what doesn't. So I think that's why it's excellent that there is this um, Madrid uh, case study now in the making to know Okay, what was the influence of that advisory body on actual uh, officials, elected officials with decision power? Did they create a collaborative relationship? Was it antagonistic? Um, did they provide useful information or were they overall redundant? You know, and once we know what they contribute and can and cannot do, and once we've bought also some, some, some trust between the old representatives and the new ones, I think we'll get a sense of um, how to go faster, you know, deeper, uh, and, 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 and sort of institutionalize this in a, in a more systematic way. And so, uh, just speaking to my own biases, when you're, when you're talking about the problem of agenda setting, that, that the agenda setting power is, is so great, I, I agree completely, and I, you, know, you see that in the U.S., the system that I'm most familiar with, just in what bills are even brought to the floor. So you might have a lot of, a lot of enthusiasm behind a particular bill, but if you don't have the, the approval of the majority leader in the Senate or the Speaker of the House in the House, then it's just it's never going to be voted on whatsoever. So you don't even get a recognition of that. Yeah, so and that's exactly what happened, for example, in Finland, uh, same thing. It's through a citizen initiative that they managed to pass uh, um, gay marriage, for example. This was something mm -hmm. that, in fact, elected officials on both sides of the aisle believed in or wanted to support, but they didn't, somehow the, the partisan logic didn't allow them to ever bring this to a, to a, to a vote. So it had to come from outside. And, and same thing in, uh, in Ireland on, um, on gay marriage uh, earlier and, and on abortion last year. These are issues that the, the, they were the third rail of politics in Ireland. You just couldn't touch them as an elected official. So it had to be in the hands of ordinary citizens to have a chance of being debated and voted on. And so doesn't that paint a path forward is to, is to say, well, look, the current bodies have this bottleneck of we're only going to bring a single item to the floor at a time. Whereas these initiative systems allow for you know, thousands of competing ideas to try to make it onto the ballot. Yeah. So we, you know, so we're building all the digital technology with with the Liquid US platform, and so the way we treat it is, you can, if you think that you have a piece, a new solution to a problem in your community on the local level, the state level, or the national level, you can create a Liquid initiative, like a citizens ref, a citizens referendum, basically. It's not, um, it's not forced upon anybody. It's not like it's on a ballot that everybody has to vote on, but it is available for people to start building support. So the point is that you don't have to ask anyone's permission to bring uh, problems and solutions to the wider conversation. Yeah. No, no, I like this idea of liquid democracy very much. I, I um, Generally speaking, I think that um, making the role uh, of representative more accessible and and the status of uh, you know being represented or, or, or being representing more fluid which I suppose is also the idea behind liquid democracy is actually excellent um, so I, I would call that a form of self-selected representation it's whoever wants to take on the role of you know a representative for the rest of us to fight for a particular idea and bring it to the floor and gather you know signatures then they qualify as a representative. I, I would call them even you, you could you know if if they function along the lines of vote delegation and things like that, they are they are actually liquid representatives in in my terminology. Yeah. Uh, so so this is yet another form of, of representation that you can add to the toolkit of of this new open democracy. You know, that's just trying to pluralize 
our, our understanding who, of who can speak for our, on behalf of the people. The other thing that's nice about it is that in terms of, of getting the getting it adopted, getting the government to recognize it, is you do have this path of I'm going to run for office in the existing electoral system and um, just use my decisions will be based upon this new liquid system. So, it, so basically, even localities that don't right now have a citizens initiative process have a mechanism to effectively adopt this sort of representation for themselves right now without needing to ask uh, the current people in power's permission. Right. To me, there's something about that 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 seems like a distinct advantage opposed to the sort of reforms that require a constitutional amendment or require the, um, the current people in power to recognize legitimacy in another way. Uh, any other, so before we wrap up, any other last thoughts before we have to go? Um, no, uh, check in with me again in a, in a few yeah, exactly. months when I've had time to sit down and look at all this uh, observational data I've gathered from the French, uh, French debate. I think it's fascinating. There's a, a lot that will come out of that. I think that would be interesting. And you have your new book coming out? Uh, coming out, not yet, but I am, I'm supposed to give it to the publisher on July 1st. So it's going to be a year after that, maybe. But you should I see. see it. And where, if people want to look more into your work and follow along, where, where do you, should they go? Uh, they can go on academia.edu. I have all my papers there. They, there's also my own website, www.mynamehelenlandemore.com. And I also have a bunch of papers and talks there. Um, yeah, generally. Google Excellent. <laughs> Excellent. Well, thank you very much. And hopefully you, we'll get David. to do this again soon. Yep. Yeah. Bye. Take care. Take care. Thank you.